this is going to be another question and answer video. And I received a question about the plan of salvation. And they asked if I could clearly lay out the plan of salvation and tell people what it is we are trusting in exactly to be saved. The quick answer is that I'm not trusting in living a good life before or after I'm saved to go to heaven. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and resurrected. That's what I'm trusting in. He paid the payment. I either accept it or reject it, and I accepted it. So I get to go to heaven because of that, and that's it. But 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, this is the gospel. If you ever are asked, what's the gospel, this is the gospel. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You can't mention the gospel, the whole gospel, without mentioning the word sin. Notice it says he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's why Jesus had to die. So if I was going to tell you about salvation, I would tell you that you're a sinner. Because that's why you need to be saved. That's why you need a savior. In Romans 5.12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Sin came in the world through Adam, and because of that, you were born a sinner yourself. And Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You need salvation because you are a sinner. You need a Savior because you can't save yourself. You can't do good enough to get saved. And that is why your salvation isn't of works. This means you can't do good things to get it or to keep it. When somebody says salvation is not of works, that means you can't do good things to get it or to keep it. And the Bible is clear about this. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by works, but we should do good works after we're saved. Not to stay saved, not to prove we're saved, but because we love God and we want to do what's right. So no one is, I'm not here teaching that you shouldn't try to live right or that you shouldn't try to do good things after you're saved. That's a lie that people say when they watch my videos. They say, well, he's saying you can do whatever you want. I never said you should do whatever you want. But in Romans 4, 4 through 5, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. Jesus did, he died for the sins of everybody. You just have to accept the payment. Imagine that you are in prison and someone says, if you believe me, then I'll pay your way out and then give you a mansion one day. Not only will I pay you out, pay your way out, but I'll give you a mansion and a crown one day. Imagine someone saying, I don't accept the payment and they just stay in prison. That's exactly what you're doing when you reject the payment that Jesus paid for on the cross. When you reject that payment, Jesus paid for all your sins on the cross. You don't want to reject that payment. You accept the payment by believing on the facts. The fact is that Jesus Christ lived a righteous life, died by shedding his blood on the cross, was buried and resurrected. Those are the facts, and that is what you put your trust in. You're trusting in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross to pay for your sins. If somebody asked you, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? You should say, I'm trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins, was buried and resurrected. Imagine that Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross is all you knew. Imagine you can't remember what you did in the past. And obviously, you don't know what's going to be in the future. But all you know is Jesus and him crucified. That's all you need to know. And that is all you need to believe on to be saved. Everything else outside of that 
doesn't amount to a hill of beans when it comes to getting saved and a reservation in heaven. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Notice it says, Believe on. That's why I like to say believe on a lot, because this is what the Bible says. You know, I, it just really, I think it puts in people's mind that they're, they got to put their trust in Him. Not just knowing the facts, not just saying, hey, I believe in, I believe Jesus is real. It's you're putting your trust in Jesus to pay for your sins. Not just believing he existed. And the Bible is so clear in Romans ten thirteen and 14. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. People are against a sinner's prayer. People say you have to say a sinner's prayer. It goes back and forth. Everywhere you look, men are trying to make salvation more complicated, get people more confused. The truth is, if you didn't believe in your heart, then why would you even say a sinner's prayer? Notice it says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Before the words even left your mouth, you would have already believed in your heart to salvation. So it's not the prayer which saves, it's the belief that took place in your heart. But there's really no need to get worked up about it and say that someone's doing wrong by praying when they got saved. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You can't be justified by the works of the law, doing good things or abstaining from bad things. You can't be justified by that, but you're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross to pay for all your sins? Galatians 3.11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Romans 3.24 and 25, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The night that I got saved, I knew I was a sinner. I heard a preacher explain hell fire and sin and the consequences of dying without salvation. I didn't know anything about the Bible. My grandparents told me the gospel as a kid, how that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. So I had all the facts, but I hadn't done anything with those facts. There was something in me that knew I was a sinner, knew I was going to hell. There wasn't anything in me that denied the facts that they had told me. I had just never trusted on Jesus Christ and what he did on the, on the cross to be my payment for sin until that night. That's when I got saved. I got down on my knees, which you don't have to do. I asked the Lord to save me, even though you don't get saved by asking. It's the heart belief. And before I even asked him to save me, he had already saved me. Because how could I ask him to save me unless something in me believed on him and believed that he would? And before the words even left my mouth, I'd already believed in my heart to salvation. The reason people pray a prayer or say something when they get saved is because it's natural for a man to pray a prayer and ask to be saved because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Some people act like if you even open your mouth when you're getting saved that you didn't get saved. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. If you've seen these same preachers and uh, people saying this, but they act, it's almost like they think you're lost if you even open your mouth when you got saved. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your heart and your mouth are connected. I believed in my heart to salvation. It was my heart belief that saved me, not my prayer. And if you'll take a man's salvation away because he prayed a prayer when he got saved, there's something wrong with you. But I didn't do good works to get saved. I didn't stop a certain sin in order to get saved. I didn't stop committing a certain sin in order to stay saved. Even though I yielded myself to the leading of the words of God to get rid of my pet sins in a process, that still isn't what saves me. And I still sin every day. I'd be sinning if I said I didn't. I don't want to sin, but what do I end up doing? The flesh wants to sin. The new man wants to live right, and I have a war going on. 
A lot of people think I'm against repentance. You see a lot of the comments, they say, well, he doesn't believe in repentance. I'm not against repentance. The Bible plainly teaches repentance. I, it says in Matthew 9, 13, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 15, 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Acts 20, 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 6, 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. By reading what Paul wrote about salvation, the repentance the Lord expects from a lost person can't be to quit sinning or to stop a certain sin. It has to mean a change of mind like it does in Genesis 6, 6. You say, well, when God repented, he did an action afterwards and destroyed man with the flood yes when you repented you did an action you changed your mind and your action was believing on jesus christ it wasn't stopping a certain sin or something like that it was you changed your mind about yourself and your sin and you believed on the lord jesus christ you quit relying on your own goodness to get you to heaven and you relied on your on the lord jesus christ the holy spirit showed me the truth about sin and about my own unrighteousness, which wasn't righteousness at all, and I changed my mind about it. I changed my mind about who I was and the direction I was going, and I turned to Jesus Christ and believed on Him for salvation. It didn't have anything to do with not sinning before salvation. It had nothing to do with not sinning after salvation. But that's repentance toward God that it talks about in Acts 20, 21. Even after you get saved... There's repentance that goes on. And this repentance has nothing to do with getting saved or staying saved. Just like in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. A preacher has preached on a certain sin I was committing before. I was filled with sorrow. I repented of that sin and cleaned that part of my life up. However, this had nothing to do with my salvation. I was already saved. And I'm not against telling a sinner to repent and believe the gospel. I just may not believe repent means what you say it means. If you're saying it means stop sinning or quit a certain sin, or, or if you believe that if a person commits a certain sin, then he really didn't repent and get saved, that's wrong. You don't know that. And as I said in the video last week, a Christian is capable of committing any sin and living in that sin. Because you still have a free will to choose sin after salvation. And many people say you're trying to tell people that they can live however they want. I'm not saying that at all. I believe you're just mad at me because I don't believe exactly like you believe. I don't tell anyone they should sin. They were accusing Paul of the same thing you're accusing me of. In Romans 3.8, Paul says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. They were accusing Paul of teaching, let us do evil that good may come, or what they say to us today. You teach you have eternal security, so you can just do whatever you want, and you're still going to go to heaven. The, the way that they say it makes it sound like, oh, we're teaching, we have eternal security, so we can go out and live it up and party. and That's crazy. That's not what Paul's saying. That's not what I'm saying. You shouldn't sin. But there are cases where Christians do live like a lost person even though they're saved. And Paul makes it clear that you can make yourself obedient to God or you can make yourself a servant to the flesh. In Romans six fifteen and 16, it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. The verse really clears up some things. Who are you yielding yourself to? The flesh or the new man? Are you yielding yourself to sin and to death or of obedience unto righteousness? If you're yielding to the flesh, then you're going to live like a lost person. If you're yielding yourself to God and what He says in this book, then you're going to live like a saved person. But how you're living never changes the fact that you are saved if there was a day when you did believe the gospel. So what do I do about a Christian around me that lives like a lost person? Well, for one, I'm not going to hang out with them. I may have to work with them at work. 
I may have to sit next to them in line, but I'm not going to hang out with them because then they'll rub off on me. And until they give me a testimony of salvation, I'm just going to assume they're lost and pray that they get saved. That is all I can do. Pray that they would get saved if they are lost and pray that they would get right if they are already saved. I understand what a lot of people are thinking. I understand where they are coming from. They are afraid when you talk like I'm talking in this because they think it encourages people to live for the flesh. It doesn't. And if it did, it isn't our fault that they abuse the grace of God. I also understand where people are coming from when it comes to easy believism. My definition of easy believism is that it is easy to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Most times people's definition is of easy believism is somebody prayed a prayer and didn't even mean it from their heart and was just trying to get rid of somebody that was trying to get them to get saved. Now, if that is what easy believism is, then it is wrong. I'm not saying that somebody just says, oh, I, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved. Did they believe from the heart? That Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and that they're putting their trust in that. If they did, they're saved. If they're just saying things without a heart belief, then they didn't get saved. But someone who just prays a prayer with no heart belief is not saved. I'm not saying that they are. But that's not easy believism. That's easy prayerism. But if someone prays a prayer and believe from the heart, then they are saved. They believe from the heart. Salvation is so simple and when people keep adding stuff to it, it's got everyone in a confused mess. And most of the questions I've been getting are from saved people who are struggling with having complete assurance of salvation because preachers are telling them that they aren't saved because they've committed a certain sin or something. Your trust should be completely in Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. His life is righteous. And your life in this flesh before and after salvation would never be righteous enough to save you or to keep you saved. And what you do with your life after salvation doesn't, doesn't even prove you're saved because good works can be counterfeited. All it proves is who are you, you are yielding yourself to. You're either yielding yourself to the flesh or you're yielding yourself to the new man. And I'm in no way denying that a person is a new creature after salvation. I'm not. I've read this verse a hundred times, especially... When I do these videos like this, I always mention how you are a new creature after salvation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, I, I taught this one time in a preacher... A very knowledgeable, knowledgeable preacher, teacher that's been teaching the Bible way longer than me came up to me and told me that I'm the only one who he's, who he's ever heard teach this thing right because I'm not making it about the flesh because what is new? What's new about you? It's the inner man. After you get saved, it's the inner man that's new, not the flesh. Your flesh ain't new. It's old. Nothing changed about it when you got saved. And that is why you are waiting on a new body. If this verse, if these verses, because see a lot of people are making it, they're making it be about, you know, after you get saved, if you are, are committing certain sins and doing certain things, then you, then you really didn't get saved because if you're saved, then you're a new creature. So they're making it apply to the flesh a little bit too here. But if your flesh is new, why do you need a new body? Your flesh isn't new. It's old. Nothing changed about it when you got saved. And that is why you're waiting on a new body at the rapture. Listen, you're a new creature, but you're waiting on a new body. This flesh is bad. There's nothing good about it. It fights you. It's fighting you every day. You know it is. You, you know when you get up in the morning, you're fighting the flesh. Even all these guys, and there's thousands of them, they got everything right except this. They think that if a person who claims to be a Christian is going out and drinking or doing drugs or fornicating or shacking up, they think if he continues to live that way, then he really didn't get saved. They think that for some reason. Even though it's going against all of these verses that I'm showing you. Like Romans 7:18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, 
dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paul knew his flesh was sinful. And for this reason, Paul knew that some Christians live like the devil because they are yielding themselves to the old man and not the new creature. You're forgetting about the two natures of the believer. You're forgetting about your standing and your state. You're forgetting about salvation versus discipleship. Two different things here. Now, I understand where the guys are coming from that believes the complete opposite of what I'm believing. They see Christians out living like the devil. It's dis disgusting, them, and it is disgusting. It's a tragedy. There's nothing good about seeing a Christian live like a lost person. But it doesn't mean he's lost. It means he's yielding himself to the flesh and not the spirit. And I don't know how much more basic you could explain this. I don't know why that they can't understand it. And I've tried to wrap my head around why they believe what they believe. I mean, I've looked into it. I've listened to all the sermons about it. I've heard them teach it for the past 10 years that I've been saved. That if you do such and such, then you really didn't get saved. I've heard it a thousand times. And I just don't know. They're using 2 Corinthians 5.17. I just don't see that there at all. Because it says in... Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, all things are become new. If it's meeting all things and counting the flesh, then this would mean you didn't sin at all. If it may, And then it says in the next verse, all things are of God. If this counts the flesh, it would mean you had to be sinlessly perfect. So that can't be what it means because none of us are. And even they would admit to that, that we're not sinlessly perfect. You see, Paul... Paul's flesh didn't delight in the law of God. That is why there is a war going on. And you aren't going to win every battle with the flesh. That is why some Christians at the judgment seat of Christ get nothing. Even if there wasn't Christians who lived for the world, like Demas who forsook Paul, having loved this present world, then every Christian would get every crown and rule over cities in the kingdom. Everybody would be looking good at the judgment seat of Christ. We'd all be leaving looking good. But that isn't how it will be. There will be Christians who don't get any rewards. I'll probably be one of them myself because we live for the flesh too much. And a lot of guys teach that if a person doesn't have evidence through works after getting saved, then they really didn't get saved. That's what they say. But listen, you can believe that all you want. But when it comes right down to it, if you really believe that, then you're going to have to admit that everyone in your church is most likely lost for the most part, and the most people that you're most people you're baptizing are false converts, and most people you're letting join the church are false converts, because you know most of those people don't do nothing for God. They don't because just because they may not commit adultery physically, they may not be homos physically, they may not be murdering people physically, but they will sit and watch that trash on TV and get pleasure out of it. And you know what Paul says in Romans one thirty two: who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Then it says in the next chapter, with the word therefore, showing you it's connected to that verse, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for, where, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So they may be against homos, they may be against adultery, but they'll sit and laugh at Ellen Degenerate on TV. They may be against sin, but they'll laugh at comedians who get up and take God's name in vain. Where's the evidence of their salvation? But you'll say he has evidence of salvation because he isn't doing those things physically or he's coming to church and tithing and all these things. But let's take it a step further. If everyone who got saved will have evidence of salvation through works, then where is their good works? You see, they may abstain from bad works, but where is their good ones? A lot of times people think just because somebody's not doing bad things anymore, it means that they're showing great evidence. But where's all the good things? James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The majority of Christians who don't commit outright abominable sins aren't doing anything, period. They have a lifestyle of not doing anything good, which isn't good a good lifestyle. When it comes to looking for evidence of salvation, some guys take it so far that they begin to try and determine the standard of righteousness a person has to show to be saved. I've seen sermons of men doing just that. 
I've seen a sermon titled 10 Things Every Person Must Do If They Are Really Saved. What a mess. If you're going to convince me you're saved, if you really want to convince me that you're saved, all you have to do is give me your testimony, and if it matches the book, then I believe you're saved. If you tell me that you knew you were a sinner and on your way to hell and you believed on Jesus Christ to be your payment, then I believe you're saved. Do I know 100%? No, because I can't see your heart. But I'm taking you at your word, your testimony. Now, if you don't have a desire for God, if you don't have a desire for the Bible, and you don't care about living right, then check up on your salvation. Make sure you really are saved. There's nothing wrong with making sure. But I can't tell you if you're saved or not. Unless you tell me that you don't believe or that you rejected the gospel. I can't see your heart. Now, something I, I, I can't help but think is, if a person... If I see a person living wicked, I mean, I automatically assume that they're lost. I mean, if you're acting like the devil, I assume you're lost. I assume most people I come in contact with are lost anyway. But I still can't see their heart. And for example, there was this one guy that cussed and told dirty jokes and acted like the devil at work. And I noticed he was always staring at me and watching me. And then one day we, we were alone and he asked me, how do you do it? And I said, do what? And he said, how do you not tell dirty jokes and cuss and laugh at these jokes? And how do you just read your Bible in front of all these guys that are cussing? And, and I said, well, I'm a Christian and I don't believe in doing that stuff. And, he's, and, and he said, well, I am too, though. And then he gave me a clear testimony of salvation. He was just as saved as I was, but he lived for the flesh and he knew it. And just by seeing me reading the Bible and not laughing at his dirty jokes, it put him under conviction. He still never lived right that I know of because he was afraid of the other men. I always assumed he was lost until he gave me that testimony. I mean, you just don't know. You would have to have super spiritual eyes to see who is saved and who isn't saved. So I just, I'm not quick to just say someone's not saved. I'm not. I, just, I don't like that. With the lack of Bible reading and Bible teaching to help Christians grow in the Word, no wonder they don't act saved. You go to the average church and they don't even have the right Bible, and then the ones that do have the right Bible don't even know why it's the right Bible, and they just talk about the same three things every service, and the people don't know anything except them three things. And then them three things that are talked about, usually they ain't even doing those. But somebody else asked a question that uh, similar to this topic about believing in vain and keeping in memory what Paul preached. Because you know in those verses we read at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, where it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So the question was, what does keep in memory mean? What's that all about? And what is this if stuff all about? Well, first off, even if you quit believing, if you believed in the past, you're still saved. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So if a person quit believing, they're still saved, if there was a day when they did believe the gospel, no matter what. Even though I personally believe an atheist who, who says they used to be a believer are mostly the time just liars trying to get make themselves more credible. You know, it's possible for a person to to get discouraged and say that the Bible's fake or something, even after they've been saved, according to that verse in Second Timothy two thirteen. Do I think that's a rare thing? Yeah, I, and I've not met anybody personally that's done that. But what is this all about here in First Corinthians fifteen? Verse 2, the way a lot of guys are reading reading it is like, you are saved if you keep in memory. They're saying it like Paul is making it with strings attached, adding a condition to salvation or something. But it's not like that. Paul is saying, if you will, keep in memory. For example, someone might say, do that for me if you will. So Paul isn't saying like, you are saved if you do this. He's saying it like, keep this in memory if you will. He's saying it like, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So what is, what is he wanting us to keep in memory? It's the gospel that he preached, and specifically the resurrection. He says, by which also you are saved, 
If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. In 2 Timothy 2.8, it says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul's wanting you to remember that resurrection. And when it comes to believing in vain, it makes no sense for a person to believe the gospel and then not believe in the resurrection. If you're believing the gospel without believing the resurrection, then you are believing in vain. If you don't believe the resurrection, it's most likely because you believe Jesus Christ was a regular man. And if he was a regular man, then he was also a sinner, and you're still in your sins. So you would be believing in vain. If you believe Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and was buried and no resurrection, you're just believing in vain. If you don't believe the resurrection, and if you're trusting in your good works, you're believing in vain. For example, the Church of Christ are trusting in Jesus Christ plus water baptism. This is believing in vain. They're mixing works in. Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And look to look at the context of, of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul even says, if Christ didn't resurrect, our faith is vain. And that's what led me to believe that believing in vain has to do with the resurrection. Somebody not believing the resurrection or if he didn't resurrect, which he, we know he did resurrect. But 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 17 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. You'd be believing in vain if it, if it wasn't for the resurrection. Or if you are believing everything but the resurrection, that's believing in vain. And there are Christians who believe that way. They believe Jesus died. They believe he was buried, but they don't believe in the resurrection. They're professing Christians, but you have to be a Christian, you have to believe the resurrection. Or you're not believing the gospel. You're believing a false gospel. And I mean, if somebody tells you that they're believing Jesus died on the cross and was buried, but they don't believe he resurrected, then they then you could say that they are lost because they didn't even believe the gospel. And it says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. And I used to think the believing in vain here was just referring to someone who was knowing the facts and not putting their trust in Christ, which that person wouldn't be saved. But when you read the whole chapter, it, Paul is saying it's vain to be saved by believing a gospel without a resurrection. Or if, the, if there was no resurrection, it would be vain. For example, some professing Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross and was buried, and they don't believe in the resurrection. They believed in vain. What's the point in believing in it if it doesn't have any saving power? The cross is important. That's where he shed his blood. The burial is important, and that proves that he died. But without the resurrection, it's all worthless. Because if he didn't resurrect, then he was just a regular man, and everything you're believing in is vain because he wouldn't have any saving power. And going by context of 1 Corinthians 15, that is what it looks like to me. But there is no way that the if, even if you don't agree with my interpretation, you have to agree with this. There's no way that the if of 1 Corinthians 15 too is implying someone could lose salvation or that Paul is attaching some strains to salvation. Because once you're born again, you can't get unborn. That settles it for me. That's very clear. The same way you can't get unborn physically it's the same way you can't get unborn spiritually. You can try every way in the world to find you a verse that says you can get unborn again. It ain't going to happen. You can't get unborn again. We should always go by the clear verses first. And the clear verses show a person can't lose salvation. And that they are saved by grace through faith plus nothing. And even if they quit believing, they still can't get unborn again. If they were really born again. That's all it comes down to. What it comes down to is... I don't know your sa I, I can't tell you 100% that you're saved only you and God and the devil know that. But Romans 8:38 and 39 settles it for me. Paul says for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
when it comes right down to it, I'm taking God at his word. I'm persuaded that nothing can separate, from, separate me from the love that is in Christ Jesus.